Welcome, everyone. We're extremely pleased to be able to welcome the 25th Annual Cali Conference and all of you uh, to Denver Law. I'm Marty Katz. I'm the dean here. Uh, and we're, we're really thrilled that we can uh, to do this conference here this year. At Denver Law, we pride ourselves on the deliberate application of technology in support of our teaching and our training mission. Our graduates are entering a world saturated with technology, and they need to know what works well and what will support their goals to do the work that the world needs lawyers to do in the 21st century. But technology is constantly changing and improving most of the time. Um, so we need to keep current in terms of ways that we can help our students stay current. And the Cali Conference is a great way for us all to do this. Our own educational tech department works hard every day, as all of your school's departments do, to support our faculty in the work they do in the classroom. Over the last decade or more, they've also worked hard to support the faculty in extending the classroom into online environments. These, of course, are as simple as twin or blackboard sites for each class, but more recently, increasingly advanced as online streaming and synchronous classes uh, with students in the classroom, but also in remote locations. And as a side note, along those lines, uh, all of the sessions here during this conference will be streamed live and archived on Cali's YouTube channel, so check them out. Law schools today are under significant pressure, and rightly so, to make their work relevant in today's marketplace. We need to serve our current students better, but also to reach out to new groups of students who might be well served by teaching through hybrid or even fully online models. Many schools are doing this. I'm pleased to actually hear we, we recently appointed a member of our faculty, David Thompson, uh, with the help of outside donor funding uh, to work on this in a more focused way. David is our new uh, John Dwan Chair in Online Teaching and Learning. All of you are serving your law schools to stay relevant and focused on a bright future. We know this isn't easy work by any means, but I hope that over the next few days you'll learn some new things and be energized by the camaraderie of your fellow travelers on this incredibly important path. I'd like to thank, before we go any further, I'd, I'd like to thank a few people who've really made this conference happen. Uh, Lori Malenar, uh, who is, is truly incomparable, is, is our events uh, director here, and, and, and she's spearheaded this effort. Uh, Jessica Hogan, Wayne Rust, Mobile Belifa, and our entire educational tech department. Uh, I saw Tim Mitchell here a few minutes ago, and Jessica, they've all done just a terrific job. And Mike Latimer does our, our room and, and space scheduling, and Diane Burkhart directs our library, and, and they've all done a terrific job as well. So please join me in thanking all of the people who've made this happen. So welcome to Denver Law. Have a great conference. And where's the next guy who's supposed to be doing this? <laughs> I think we're supposed to look up. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Much appreciated. <laughs> See you. Oh, see you. Oh, where's my microphone? Where's that? Oh, there it is. There it is. Welcome to the 50th annual conference for law school computing. Can you believe I've been doing this for 50 years? I can't. I think this is a good time to take a selfie. No, I can't forget it. So over the 50 years of the Kylie Conference, we've covered a lot of interesting topics, haven't we, right? We've transformed legal education. We've uh, built tools. Let's see if I can get this to work. We've rebooted legal education multiple times. We've unbound the, the, uh, the casebook. Um, we've even built uh, robots to teach our students. 
um, and drove innovation um, with strange people. Oh, that's me, oh my God, I uh, was a funny guy. Uh, we, we rode the next wave, and of course, 25 years ago, we were in this very spot to, with, uh, with, with, with such a confusing theme that I can't even pronounce it. Super Cali flippalistic. Uh, I gotta take a breath. Experientially disrupt delicious. But then things took a turn for the worse. In 2016, the Department of Justice, based on the Microsoft precedent, decided to break up the Ewing Dell casebook monopoly, and uh, well, we had to end that business. Uh, the good news is A to J Author, our software that is used to automate court forms, uh, well, it uh, went sentient and managed to replace eight of the nine Supreme Court justices. <laughs> <clears throat> Not bad. Good work, Sam. In 2019, Just Fast Casia purchased Walters Thompson Elsevierberg, and they ran out of names, so they just called the new company Law Stuff. <laughs> now, law school IT in 2022 was pretty bad. Those were the zombie years. Uh, the snacks were interesting. In 2023, Cloning was perfected. <laughs> and one of the first persons to take advantage of that was, of course, our good friend who died soon after, John Haywood. <laughs> now, it turns out when you make copies of copies, things get a little messed up. <laughs> and he got a little carried away with it, but over 60 of those folks ended up as uh, tenured faculty in law schools. <laughs> Applications continued to decline, I might add. In 2025, we had our first conference in space. Unfortunately, the beer hikers opened the wrong hatch, and well, <laughs> we haven't seen much of them lately. In 2027, Elmer, who looks as young as he did today, or 25 years ago, well, one of his uh, server uh, re reboots uh, sort of got out of hand, and I had to give that entire conference from a bunker. <sighs> Those were the days. In 2030, you know, we're in space, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, Tom opened up Moonly and Marsley. <laughs> this is awesome. There wasn't, there isn't much law up there, so I guess it was pretty easy. And in 2032, Cali perfected their first implantable JD chip, and it was approved and accredited by the ABA, and bar passes rates immediately spiked to 100% and stayed there forever. <laughs> In 2035, we gave out hoverboards to everybody, again. And in 2039, well, the first alien attended the conference. He only went to one session, it was the one on student printing. <laughs> so in 2040, today, the 50th conference, we have no choice but to give you this theme. What the hell happened to legal education? Now, I don't have to tell you that story. You know, you lived it. And you just heard the dean about all the changes that are happening and that all the things that we have to deal with as IT folks. Well, I looked back in the archives and I found that back in 2015, yes, um, I actually recorded a message and put it in a time capsule for us today. So let me play that for you if I can find the thing. Here we go. Damn, technology doesn't work today. Oh, back it. Oh, hit the wrong button. Make, make the personal 
some different value of the form. If I could distill it down to a single word, just one word to describe the feeling I have about the last 25 years, it says, the word is gratitude. Gratitude. For 25 years I've been doing this conference, and the one word that came to mind when I started to think, how can I say this in one word? It's thank you. Thank you for your support of Cali. Thank you for coming to this conference. Thank you for making friends with each other and with myself. Thank you for your contributions that make this a great conference. So here we are in 2015, Conference for Law School Computing. Super Cali flip ballistic experience we disrupt the locious. We couldn't decide on a theme. There's so much going on these days in law school education. And so we decided to just put it all in a bucket. Let me take care of some of the housekeeping now. Of course, thank you to the University of Denver for hosting. It's never easy to host. We like to what we call exercise the IT folks and the facilities planning folks with our conference. And so uh, we really appreciate their, their patience and their ability to respond and they have been extremely responsive. Thank you to the vendors. We, you are part of the community as well. We want you to attend the sessions. We want you to be part of the community. And in case you think that this is unfair, here I just uh, rejiggered it a little bit. And if that's not good, there, we'll do it again. All right? <laughs> so thanks, folks. Thank you to my own staff. I hardly did any work at all on this thing. It, it, ran, it seemed to run like clockwork. I guess we'll see in two days, really. But uh, my, my staff is the best staff that anybody could have, and I really appreciate all the hard work they did. <laughs> my wife is watching. Housekeeping. So we have, a, we, have a, we have a social game. We always want you to be getting to know each other a little better. And so everybody in their, uh, 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 everybody in their uh, 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 what do you call it, name badges has a time trial card with uh, either a case, and you can tell from the lower left-hand corner what type of card it is, either a case or a SCOTUS, uh, uh, a Supreme Court Justice or a public law or an amendment. And what you have to do is find somebody else with a card of those types of, uh, those types of information on them. Where is it? Here it is. All right. And then you fill that information in. Now, well, the first one is yours is, of course, free. Or you put your name across the top. And you have to find two Supreme Court justices, two cases, one amendment, and two public laws to fill in. And they put their name and email address on that. And we're not just asking you so that you can meet people. We want you to meet people and say hi to them. But everybody on your list, when we, do, when we, when we collect all of these and pull the raffle, everyone on your list will get um, some of these things, they're called tiles. What you do is you can attach them to things and then you can use an app to find them anywhere in the world. And you will get some of those tiles, four or eight of those, and a $200 uh, Amazon gift certificate. So play the game by meeting other people. Get to know them, ask them what their favorite book is. Ask them questions. Housekeeping selfie sticks. We're going, we're going all in on selfie sticks. I've got six selfie sticks here. So the first six people who rush the stage after we're done and grab them can have those selfie sticks, but you've got to use them. You've got to walk around the conference and annoy people by saying, hey, take a picture with me, and post them with the CaliCon, did I already pass that? With the CaliCon15 hashtag, Twitter, Facebook, upload it to the Slack channel, something like that. All right? Uh, water, we're, at, we're, at, we're in the Mile High City, right? So stay hydrated. Feel a little headache, chances are you need to drink some water, right? So, stay, so, so be sure to drink lots of water today. If you, we, when we pack the bags for the, uh, 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 for the uh, bags and give you your t-shirt, everybody got either a large or an extra large. Now I know not all of you are large or extra large, and so if you want a different size t-shirt after noon, go to the registration room, <clears throat> which is room 145, and you can swap it for a smaller or larger t-shirt, all right? Housekeeping, don't forget, we are live streaming this entire conference. Every single session is being live streamed and recorded. And what that means is the mics are hot, even between sessions. And so if you're having interesting conversations about people, I can't believe she said that. 
that will go out over the live stream. So be careful, right? It's an NSA world. <clears throat> Tomorrow, Friday at 8.45 a.m. on the steps right out this door, we're all going to gather and we've got a photographer who's going to take a big group photo of everybody on the steps. So just show up there and line up by, uh, let me think, uh, don't, by height? No, 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 no. Just line up. Just show up, right? 8.45 a.m., group photo tomorrow. It's two schedule changes. Augmenting clinical training with Larry Farmer has been canceled. Larry wasn't able to get, uh, get here. Uh, schedule change, active learning in the law school classroom, tips and technology. <clears throat> Karen Lundquist, it was moved from today at 2.30 to Friday. That would be tomorrow at 9 a.m. There is no plenary tomorrow morning. Slight change from past Kelly conferences. The next plenary is Saturday morning in the auditorium, which is across the way. There's a two, law, two library tours, one of them for the law library at noon today and tomorrow. So lunch begins at 11.30. That gives you a half hour to eat, slam some food down, and come back. And at noon, meet at the second floor entrance to the library at the top of the stairs for a tour of the law library or a tour of the new campus library at the Anderson Academic Commons. And it's at noon, Thursday and Friday. Meet at the Circle of Flowers in front of the law school. You know where that is. All right. For those who signed up for the airport buses, two buses will depart at 145 on Saturday at the corner of East Asbury and South Gaylord. There will be signs. So the point of this is for people who are checking out on Saturday and so they want to bring their luggage with them. And so we thought it'd be nice to have a bus to do that instead of having to walk them along on the uh, rapid transit or the light rail. <clears throat> there will also be bus service on Saturday morning from the Double Tree to the law school for those who signed up for the airport bus. So in other words, there'll be a bus from the hotel here and there's a hotel and there's a bus from here at 145 to the airport. All right? Two buses will depart the Double Tree at 7:45 a.m. on Saturday. Luggage may be left in room 145 on Saturday, but must be picked up by 2 p.m. or we will sell it on eBay. And now let's get to our program. First of all, though, sorry, Alan, I wanted to wait. I wanted to back up one. How many people are here for the first time? First time. Holy smoke, 20, 25%, I would say. How many here are, all, are here for either first or second time? I still consider you a newbie if you're only here for twice. Oh, like a third. That's very good. Well, first of all, welcome. And keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Everybody who's here for the first time. And everybody around them, turn around and pat them on the back, give them a high five, say, hey, welcome to the Cali Conference. <laughs> awesome. Everything is awesome. <clears throat> Second, so for the next three days, I know amongst, uh, uh, amongst uh, geeks and nerds, uh, there's a lot of uh, introversion, there's a lot of uh, difficulty of breaking social barriers and things like that. I am suspending all that. If you see a group of people talking and you're alone, don't be a wallflower, break in and say, hi, I'm from wherever university you're at, and join the conversation. That is perfectly all right to do that. If anybody looks you weird at that, say, I'm sorry, John told me to do this. <laughs> Blame me, all right? So let's get started. Alan, come on up. Alan Levine is a fellow who I've been following for uh, actually a pretty long time. Here, let's unplug. Wait. He runs Cog Dog Blog. Very good. Right? Yeah. All right. Get that out of the way. Get that out of the Keep way. talking, John. <laughs> yes, yes, sorry. Sorry, keep talking. Keep the banter going. So you are, you, you were or are, I, I wasn't sure from, from reading that, uh, uh, involved with the, um, uh, the New Media Consortium, True. which is a community of experts in educational technology. Very true. Awesome. <laughs> and, and just as interesting, I read, I read a lot of your blog posts and, 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 and said, oh man, this is the guy I want to talk to. This is the guy I want to hear, hear from. There's only 4,000 of them. <laughs> That's right. And you were involved with DS06, which is the Digital Storytelling 106, which is, one of, in my understanding, was one of the first MOOCs ever. It's not a MOOC. It's, but, but, but don't call it a MOOC, no, I'm I was about I'm to say. I'm offended, okay. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, but I heard great things about DS-106 and always wanted to get involved with. And I just thought you would be an interesting person to have come talk to us. Well, thank you, John. This guy's a hard act to follow. <laughs> when, uh... <laughs> don't forget your stick. <laughs> I know you guys just want the stick, so just bear with my talk and, and I'll try to get to 10 o'clock so you can get your sticks. Uh, when John contacted me by email 25 years ago, uh, 
he, he told me I could do whatever I wanted for a presentation. And, you know, that's kind of a dangerous thing to do with someone you only know through the internet. So uh, here we go. Um, uh, my talk, the BS about storytelling, uh, I'm making some suggestions with the pictures. When I say BS, some things probably come to mind, and so I'm going to play with that concept. Does anybody remember uh, Robin Williams in The World According to Garp? Um, T.S. Garp, there was really uh, some unclarity about where his name came from. So I'm going to play that sort of same game with uh, what I mean by BS, so bear with me in that. Uh, by the bylaws of people who do presentations about storytelling, I'm obligated to have a picture of cake paintings within the first three slides. Uh, so if, if there are uh, people keeping count, and I know you guys are on top of the laws, uh, there's a good reason for that, obviously, because we've been communicating visually for a long time. Uh, actually, they've done the presentation before me by using the same metaphor. I also, in storytelling, refer to the fact that we grew up reading stories and books. Very good. We have family stories, all kinds of family stories we tell very well. And, of course, the campfire, the ultimate symbol of storytelling. These are all things I'm obliged to do as metaphors. And I have to tell you, everybody's a storyteller. And, you know, I've seen presentations, and I hear that, and my first thought is, I'm not a storyteller, but we say that anyhow. It's a branding thing. This is actually storybranding.com. There's consultants that tell you how you can throw storytelling onto your work like some kind of magic sauce or gas additive that you throw in the fuel tank that'll suddenly do great things for you. It's like magic. And then, of course, now it's big data, big data, big data. And people have this thing about data telling stories. Well, we have some data people in the room. How does the data talk to you? A data doesn't tell any stories. We tell stories. So a good thing I didn't step in it. So what I am going to talk about, I, I think, uh, are some things from my experience both in um, creating, I'm more interested in creating stories, and not only fictional things, and also teaching, and also just trying to twist things a little bit. So my metaphor, this is my favorite one I use in every talk I do about storytelling. It's the campfire, but we get these um, Lego stormtroopers gather around a little candle. It's just a little bit different. So I encourage people, when I teach, I always tell my students to, if you don't like my assignment, do it differently. Play with reality. Storytelling, I do not give definitions. You won't get definitions. So when I do have my classes in it, uh, it's basically you're going to get 15 weeks of some experience where you're going to figure out what it means to you. But at the core of it, it's really about some forms of communication that I think are really important, uh, the way we communicate both in writing and media forms and even old-fashioned email. So, uh, first of all, the first BS, be scared. I don't have the zombies like John did, um, but this is a storyteller. This woman's name is Marilyn Therese uh, in the little town near where I live in northern Arizona. There's a little town called Pine, Arizona. They have an annual storytelling festival. You know Pine. <laughs> Do you know, you know Strawberry? Okay. They don't even know. They're from Phoenix. They don't even know where strawberries. That's where I live. Okay. Okay. You passed the test. So there's a storytelling festival. These are professionals. Marilyn, she's excellent. She looks like she's having a good time up there telling stories. She's a pro. Okay. So if, uh, let's see if I do this right, John. I'm going to mute. So, whoa, whoa, whoa. Check, check, check. There we go. All right. So I come up to you and say, <laughs> Tell me a story. What's your first song? I'll tell you what you want. So uh, I put them on the spot. Like, oh my God, what does this person want? What's rolling through my head? Uh, what sort of things? What's the expectations? This is my first thought with the same thing. I'm not a storyteller. Okay. So some of the things is we call it storytelling, but I think there's a conflation with performance. So I'm really about story making. Um, I've been on the web a little bit longer than Cali, maybe. Great history there. Um, and all the storytelling I'm interested in are stuff we can use to express ourselves, both in person, but largely the storytelling I'm interested in are in this funny uh, space on the internet. So one of the things that I do, there's not enough time, uh, I'm already going to talk way too fast, uh, but I like doing a workshop. 
is that sometimes we get groups together and I might say, uh, tell me a story about your work or your organization or the things that you do are important. And people go from the head, okay, so you're going to talk about the projects and things you're working on and maybe people you work with. Um, and they are stories, well, I'm not going to say it's not a story, but I like to do a different exercise and this is one that I use in my class because um, to get to what works in storytelling, you have to get to your heart and your gut. So if you want to, uh, this is not an activity I'm going to require you to, but um, I ask people to, to get out their keychains. And I do this one online with my students. This is their first video exercise. And I want you to find one object on your keychain um, that's sort of a launching point to tell me a story. I don't want you to describe what's on your keychain. You'd be amazed at what students carry on their keychains these days. Um, and usually, if somebody, they, they, they just do a litany, like one thing. So on my keychain, I could talk about the key to my house in Strawberry, um, and there's a lot of stories about that. There's a key to my truck, and there's a stories about driving around the country. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a launch point. But what happens when we do this is that generally we get to a place we're talking from more of a personal level. This is not a self-help group, but bear with me. And you can play with it. You can do it differently. It doesn't have to be literal. So when I do my story about my keychains, I talk about the fact I used to have a lot of keys. I was married. I had two houses. I worked. I had work keys. I had, we had two vehicles. My keychain was huge. Uh, about five years ago, I sort of gave a lot of that up. So my story is about what's not on my keychain. So one of the little things I'll tell about storytelling in terms of my big secrets sometimes is what you leave out or what happens in the negative space of your story. So here I'm going to go through really quick some things I think are important. Um, it's not the be all end all about storytelling uh, that I think is effective for all kinds of communication. The opening is everything. So. You've heard this phrase before? Right? Do I need to ask you to raise your hand? Is anybody out there? Sorry, just checking. Hi, Internet. Okay, once upon a time, those four words. If you look up on Wikipedia, you'll find that there are about 57 um, examples of that in different language and cultures, different versions of that. It's kind of a universal thing. We recognize it. It's a funny expression, too. It kind of mixes a sense of place and time. But what it totally does is right from the beginning, it establishes where you are and sometimes when you are. So, does anybody recognize this? <laughs> you laughed. I don't hear any answers. What is this? Star Wars. Star Wars, of course. That's a terrible drawing. That, that's my kind of drawing ability. Why does that work? It's a metaphor. Metaphors are fantastic. But also, Star Wars opened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. You know that. That is once upon a time. George Lucas was not stupid. He didn't invent that. He didn't even invent the scrolling credits. That's another presentation. So the opening is everything, not just in storytelling, in everything you do. So in the courses I teach, um, my students do all their work on their own websites. They create blogs. <clears throat> and when they submit their assignments, in the beginning, they'll submit something like audio assignment or assignment three. And like, you're killing me, OK? The title is everything. It's as important as a good subject line on your email, but the title, it's like a whole chance to sort of grab people's, not only their attention, but maybe tease. You don't have to give away everything in your title. So start with a good title. In fact, when I write, I don't even start writing on my blog until I've got what I think is a funny or interesting title. I don't care if you don't find it funny or interesting. It's important for me. So here is a great opening for a story. The last man alive on earth sat alone in a room. You can read that, obviously. It's, it's kind of once upon a time. We could be in the future. It's, it sounds kind of post-apocalyptic. The last man on earth. This is very interesting because this is maybe one of the shortest stories. It's two sentences. Frederick Brown wrote this story called Knock. Okay. Now this does something also interesting. It does a twist. It does the unexpected. He's supposed to be the last man on earth. Who's at the door? Is an alien? My, my, best, my first thought is like, he didn't say anything about the women, okay? <laughs> Good, okay. Just seeing if you're paying attention. This is brilliant. <clears throat> How do you get a story in two sentences? Frederick Brown did it. So the hook is important too. You want to get people interested. And a lot of times when we communicate, we start off with a lot of bullet points and background and we try to build up the narrative. But if you don't get a hook to get people interested, 
you might lose them. I'm not going to show this, um, but this is all on my website that I have references for everything. This is a great video. We found this flash drive on the side of the road, and this woman's holding up. That's in three seconds of the video, okay? Right away, I don't know about you, I want to know what's on that flash drive. Because she wouldn't be telling me that if there wasn't something interesting. If it was, oh, I found a flash drive on the road and I chucked it. There's no story there. But there is a hook. There's something to draw you in. J.J. Abrams, the, the producer, has a great TED Talk on this thing he calls the mystery box. It's a real thing and it's a metaphor. And um, it's what goes into most of his work. Uh, how many people saw Lost all the way through? There's probably too many mystery boxes, right? But it's a great talk. So. The other thing, and this is what I like to do the most, because um, I was the kid everybody called the smart ass in the neighborhood growing up. Um, it turns out the internet is like built perfectly for me, okay? Because I get to play, and, and I, I lie and make stuff up all the time, and sort of this idea of playing with people's expectations. My favorite, this is a great example of this video, I highly recommend it. Uh, Troy Library was this public library in Michigan. Uh, there was a big shortage of taxes and there was a big movement by uh, the people who don't like taxes to cut the taxes for the library. The library is going to go, can you imagine like not having a public library? And so what they did was they play with reality. They, they mounted a campaign like a, two weeks before the election and they had this whole sort of fictitious campaign of the library is going to close, yay, let's have a book burning party. And all of a sudden people are like, are you nuts? And so they actually change the expectations, change the narrative story. It's a brilliant example of what you can do uh, with an inventive approach. Probably the most important thing in stories is you got to have characters. There's no stories about rocks that sit on the ground. Well, there probably is, but. So um, I like to draw a lot of examples from uh, TV commercials. Although it's not really TV anymore, is it? But commercials are, they're very short form. You only got 30, maybe 45 seconds. So I'm going to show these two uh, commercials. They're both for technology uh, products, rather similar, but they really approach it differently. So number one, number one. <laughs> Don't do this, computer. <laughs> Imagine if you will. A presentation that gets hung while the apple spins in the air. La di da da da. So, in this first commercial, I'm going to ignore you, Apple. This first commercial is really good. So, you ever heard this thing called podium time? It's it's really the time distortion uh, factor, uh, where things just seem to go bonkers on you. And uh, let's see, keynote. Wow. Do, 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 do. So, anybody have any questions? While <laughs> <laughs> then go like this and dress rehearsal. No, it worked perfectly. We, <laughs> we, we, tell a story. Yeah, tell, a, tell story. a story about the presentation that didn't work. Oh, tell a story. Um, so, so I was, I was, I, when I was, <laughs> kid, I was an altar boy, and I used to. Uh, have to hold the thing called a patent that would uh, prevent the person from dropping the hose onto the ground. And one day, the priest, the, the another altar boy, hit the priest's chalice, and the priest dropped all the patent, all the all the all the, all the Eucharists on, under the ground. Everybody thought these guys are going to go to hell as a result of this. And true story, several years, several weeks later, the priest was walking into the garage, walking out of the garage with his bicycle, and a garbage truck backed up over him. <laughs> that was quite brilliant. <laughs> I, this is like, I might need another story at this point. I, I do have a backup, okay? <laughs> no, no, it's okay. So the altar boy, years <laughs> Total meltdown here. Oh, okay. So. <clears throat> Got to think a moment. No, no more altar boy stories. Okay. <laughs> wow, this is really not good, Alan. I'm trying to reboot. <laughs> I love this stuff. I can't help but say, 
Uh, I'm feeling great schadenfreude that this is happening to somebody with a, with a Mac. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's sitting too close to the, your computer, John. <laughs> so, this has never happened to me before. <laughs> My computer's already restarting. <laughs> Very good. Okay. You know, you need to be able to do this without the damn slides and the damn videos, okay. <laughs> and if, the, if this all fails, I will see what happens as far as doing this. So, um, I'm going to show you, uh, I wonder if I have these videos sitting around. Ba -ba 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 -ba. <coughs> Thing is, they're all over the place. <laughs> oh, Google Chrome is holding me up. Try turning it off and turning it back on again? <laughs> <laughs> I've never had this before. Okay. All right, so two lawyers, no. <laughs> Don't know any jokes. All right, so what, what I'm going to show you, <laughs> it's, it's actually these commercials are really good. The first one is a Microsoft commercial. And uh, we might get to it. If not, it, it's on my website. Anyhow, it kind of shows a product. Uh, it's kind of this tablet thing. And the guy's, he's moving charts in the clouds. It's got really good, uh, it's high production. It's really good. I'm not picking on Microsoft. It was just a good example. It's kind of like, you know, the good image, as commercials do, of a person with technology and what it could do for him. Uh, except we really don't know uh, who this person is. He's just some guy. And sort of at the end, he's like communicating with someone who is sort of his son, we, we suspect, uh, who's working on something in, in 3D. And the guy sort of says, you know, good job. And so, but it's, it's a good commercial and it sort of shows what the product can do. Um, the second commercial is um, is for um, the um, well, I can't think of the name of the phone. It's the Google phone. Okay, uh, it's about the kid uh, with uh, glassophobia, the fear of public speaking. Has anybody seen this commercial? It's really brilliant. So it's, it's this kid. He's got to do a, a thing in class, and he's got to do a thing on public speaking. So he's asking his his Google devices for help. Um, but it's a total narrative because we get drawn into this character of this boy overcoming his fears of public speaking and his Mac crashing on stage. Um, but it shows a real stark difference between things that are both um, talking about technology uh, products um, and what happens when it's, there's a character that you identify with. And if you could see these two videos, you would be stunned. You'd be saying, this is the most amazing, flawless keynote that ever happened. <laughs> Um, but the character is really important, and it, it seems pretty obvious. Um, but the thing about story structure is um, there needs to be a character that we root for because the story is on the arc of that character's trajectory. And so uh, the typical thing when I finally get around to showing uh, this presentation, uh, it comes across in the hero's journey, is the fact that this character experiences something that moves them from the ordinary world into an ex extraordinary world, and they're forever changed. I don't know about you, but I want that kind of stuff in my life, right? And I think school uh, should be doing it. Oh boy, we're getting all kinds of stuff. Um, and maybe this will finally come back. What's that? Yeah. Woo! You gonna try the video again? I don't know, I'm pretty scared of that video. <laughs> It just, it's, it's the, micro, the Microsoft jokes. Do you want to see the video? It worked. When we got to the new office, a personalized service to help you get things done. When you sign into the office, it knows who you are and remembers where you are going. It responds to your touch. And your documents travel with you. Because your creations and edits are automatically saved to the cloud. So they are always up to date across the devices you love. Your new office gives you the flexibility Danny Jr. to the car a single tap. So whether you're illustrating an idea or sharing your perspective, make it personal. Because at the end of the day, there's more than one way to get things done. And the best way is yours. Great job, son. <laughs> it's not bad. I mean, advertising is supposed to give you a sense, a feeling for what the product can do. And, and some of the technology stuff is, is pretty, uh, pretty neat. 
But just for comparison, many times I get I'm kind of emotional I mean I get kind of teared up I mean that's that's pretty moving I'm not saying every commercial or every product needs to be like that but it's a real stark difference this kid has gone on an arc and they've even done the classic they've set up a sequel does he get the girl or not great job son <laughs> all right what also works very well are putting things together which don't really work together so my real love is uh, photography and so um, one of the things I try to teach are some composition ideas about how you can sort of I mean photography is actually a process of deletion you delete everything in the world except for what you're looking through the frame so uh, I, I found this one while looking for a metaphor um, there are a lot of people on uh, uh, Flickr and social uh, photo sharing sites that take lots of pictures of Legos and Star Wars action figures. It's an entire subculture. I'm kind of like on the periphery. Um, this guy, in fact, he writes about it. He was setting up this shot of Darth Vader and the cat just walked behind accidentally. It's brilliant. It mixes scale. It says, what is going on here? It's a great metaphor. This one, what is the red, th is it radioactive? Did Neo take the blue pill? There's all kinds of suggestions you can do by playing with the power suggestion. And this one is a great example of composition. We found a white rabbit. Are you looking for it? I mean, the whole mystery of what's the white rabbit? We got the mysterious van with the dark windows. Did they take the rabbit? They look, and the, the light on the porch? Where's our rabbit? Where's our rabbit? There's a ton going on in this picture. It's just a still image with maybe a funny caption. So juxtaposition. Now, I'm going to go into the bizarre shapes. They're not really bizarre, but um, there's actually a building shaped like a giant picnic basket. There's a whole subculture of, of built. Never mind that one. Okay, the shapes of stories. Um, I forget, Gustav Freitag was a writer, uh, 19th century. He did this thing where he analyzed all the famous stories of drama in all literature. Like, he read them all, and he sort of came up with this structure. This is the formula for every Hollywood movie, just about. Even though it's called Freitag's Pyramid. He got the pyramid named after it. And by the, uh, I'm supposed to sort of fill it in with Star Wars examples. So, uh, exposition, Luke Skywalker's flying around his planet, his little hovercraft, minding his own business, everyday things. All of a sudden, he comes across some robots, some rising action, presses the button on the robot. Help me, help me, is, is, is uh, Princess Leia. He meets Obi-Wan Kenobi. He goes on this grand adventure. His parents in the Fort Lee, there's fights in the bar. There's all this rising action. The climax blows up the Death Star. Falling action, they have the big ceremony. And denouement sort of is, is sort of how things are resolved. You know, the, the empire is overthrown, at least until the next movie. And then things, and then you repeat it. This is how stories are told. And it's, it's, it makes it pretty simple, but it actually gives stories a structure. And so um, Hollywood sort of teaches it this way. They sort of make it the lumpy hill, but it's still this three-act structure. You can wrap it around a circle. You get the hero's journey, another formula. And here's my favorite one. You can find these ones. Uh, people will tell you, there's three parts to the story. There's the beginning, the middle, and the end. And I'm like, okay, you got anything else? So I call that one the obvious. The best, let's see if this video works again, is uh, Kurt Vonnegut, brilliant author. 
he gives this thing on the shape of stories. And it suffered through this video again. Hopefully my Mac won't crash. Um, and I love that he's using that te ancient technology. He plays with you. I'm glad you guys sat through that. It's, it's worth it. This is like the most key thing I find when I teach my class is the idea that stories have these shape and that's what draws our, our interest in. And those kind of shapes come into a lot of things that we do. I don't, I don't know about you, but when I write an email, like an important one, I think about that sort of shape and, and that I want to take my people on uh, who are reading this. Whoa. 
Um, I'm going to skip this next one, but this is a really great example of what happens. This is a, a Budweiser commercial, Super Bowl commercial, and there's a key thing that happens is you take out a bad thing that happens. It's the puppy that sort of gets taken, adopted by the guy. And this guy just did a version of it without that bad thing happening. And you sort of get a commercial, but without the character in distress, um, that's a really important factor in your... So I'm going to zip right through those. But uh, it's definitely worth watching. Um, and he has this great quote again, Kurt Von maybe to talk about Kurt Vonnegut. So, um, and don't go to this extreme, but you actually have to put um, in your stories and your communications uh, something for uh, your character or that's happening to sort of be an obstacle to overcome. Otherwise, there's no real shape. So there is some brain science behind this. This talk by Paul Zak is really fascinating. He's a, he's a, a neurobrain scientist and he, he's done these research studies and found there's two important neurotransmitters um, that get people to respond to stories and not just like to be moved by them but actually to motivate them. And the first one is that again like the story, the puppy commercial I didn't show you, um, there needs to be some character in distress dealing with a bad situation. Um, and, and you have to develop a sense of empathy. And he's measured uh, the brain uh, chemicals that go along with this um, and find that it's true. Um, the, the master of, um, of this idea of suspense, of course, is Alfred Hitchcock. Um, there's this thing, you know, that you're taught when you're doing public presentations, like don't let your laptop freeze on you. But um, it's sort of this thing you've heard of it, like tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you've told them. Um, I don't know about you, Aristotle, you know, who am I to criticize Aristotle? If you have to tell me something three times, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of insulted. So, um, and Hitchcock didn't do this, okay? So in Psycho, like in the beginning, the Janet Lee sort of have this sort of idea in the beginning. She's telling what's going to happen. And then, you know, midway through the movie, okay, I'm telling you what's happening. And then, of course, uh, in the end, um, tell them again what happened. That's a little playful, but... Um, Storytelling is not just for people like in the humanities and the fun stuff. It's, it's for lawyers too, right? Um, but also scientists. Um, so a lot of times in professional communication, the shape of, you've been to those PowerPoints, right? <laughs> kind of flat, not much arc to it. Um, movies, I draw a lot from movies uh, as sort of a metaphor. Um, there's a lot going on in movies, and there's the things that movies do. They really get our interest, and I'm going to skip Monsters, Inc., um, but they don't really tell you anything important. Um, this is sort of an example of explaining a scientific um, experiment, it's a commercial again, um, without sort of telling you up front the bullet points and what they're going to tell you. This may not be the greatest piece of science in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not advocating that. But what a great way. I'm not saying everything in science should be communicated like this, but we didn't know in the beginning what's going on. There's a lot of cinematic techniques. There's the shallow depth of field. There's the cuts. I love that it's a woman scientist in there. Um, the, the sound is this, a thing in movies. If, if there are people who are into film called Foley, you, you don't record all the sound in the movies. You add it later. So there's a lot of sort of ideas of filmmaking that go into communicating this idea. And so there's a book I found by this guy, Randy Olson. He was a tenure track biology prof uh, somewhere in New Hampshire, Vermont, but he had this, he, he reached the pinnacle. He was tenured, right? That, that's even hard to get these days. Um, but he always had this dream. He wanted to be a filmmaker. He wanted to do uh, documentaries. So he did the most crazy thing. He chucked his career and at like age 45, he enrolled in the USC Film School, one of the best ones out there. And the, the title of the book is from his first day of class. He's in there with a bunch of 18 to 20 year olds. Um, in, in USC film school and there's an acting coach in front of the class and he says it's a stereotypical woman who's yelling at them because they're supposed to be doing uh, impro improv activities and so she says Olson here's your prompt and he's sitting there he's thinking about what am I going to do and she yells at him she says don't be such a scientist get out of your head so it was the book is all about his discovery about what Hollywood knows about filmmaking and sort of trying to apply it to people have to publicly communicate the work they do in science, which I extend to education because the thing about movies is we go to them to escape. It arouses our attention, um, but it's not really telling us anything terribly important, right? 
Um, in science and education and law, we're trying to tell something that's important. And so we have to figure out how to do both. Great reference. So I've blown most of my time with my laptop. Um, I'm going to blow through some stuff. I call them my card tricks, if you will. These are things I've just been experimenting with over the years in terms of uh, trying to help other people practice some of their skills of um, telling stories in some different ways. So one of the first is I got fascinated by this idea of improv. I think I was at a conference presentation where someone was reading me their slides. And um, I started thinking about when you see those guys do improv, first of all, they don't have a script. Um, they're, they're speaking very um, emotionally and animatedly. And it's kind of interesting to listen. So um, I guess this idea, and I kind of, most of my ideas are not mine. I just throw things together. So you know, you know, Pecha Kucha, I'm saying it wrong on purpose. The 20 slides in 20 seconds PowerPoint format. You guys know that, right, right? Invented by some uh, Japanese architects who are bored at conference presentations. So it condenses your presentation down to six minutes and 40 seconds. And you can't wing this. You have to practice to do a good, has anybody done this or ignite? A few of you. It's, got, it's, it's, it's a lot of pressure to do this. So um, there's also this thing that went on. I think it started at a South by Southwest conference called PowerPoint Karaoke. It's kind of fun. Someone loads up one of those slide decks with 20 random images. And we were calling someone like John, who was willing to do stupid things like this, to get on stage and give a coherent talk about images he's never seen. And it's kind of fascinating. It's, it's goofy and it's fun. But what it does is it helps you practice this thing of um, thinking on the spot. So I kind of threw all those together because I love photos on Flickr. I created a site called Petcha Flickr. It does the same thing, except it pulls random photos, photos from Flickr based upon the tag. The default is dog because everything is dogs. Um, but you put in what keyword you want. You can even change the format. You can say, I want 10, 10 slides on the screen for 15 seconds. And what you have to do is you have to be able to get up and do an improv talk from these slides that are randomly changing. I know a lot of foreign language teachers use this. It's a great way to practice your conversational skills. I've heard of some um, math teachers who do this. They, they put in words like architecture or buildings. And the students have to sort of identify all the geometric figures and what they see on the screen. But it's a great way just to sort of get out of that sort of monotone speech thing and practice some speaking on the spot. I've also done that everything is in Flickr, but uh, this idea about telling a story in just um, images. So this, uh, it's called Five Card Flickr Stories. It's based upon a real card game that this guy named Scott McCloud. Anybody into comics? Oh, yeah. Yeah. This guy is genius. So um, he's got the three series of books, and it's done in comic form about understanding about comics. Yeah, and so if you're someone like comic books, that's for kids. Comics are an incredible medium for communication. And so he had this game called Five Card Nancy. And it was, again, to practice people sort of their creative uh, uh, capabilities. And so he took the old cartoon Nancy, the comic, and you cut up the strips. You separate the panels. And you throw them into a bag, and you put them out on a table in a group. You got five different panels from Nancy. And as a group, you have to pick one to start your story. So it's fun because you say, okay, I want you know, Nancy walking down the street or Sluggo you know, in the, in the drugstore. And then you throw them back in the bag, and you repeat it again, five more. And so what you have to do, and this is kind of remix, you have to sort of put together a coherent story based upon these panels from Nancy that, that don't belong together. Uh, someone invented a website that did this. I saw a, a colleague do a presentation on it. Um, I was fascinated by it because it's a great activity because people have to debate. And the last one is key. I don't like the, I, Nancy was a dumb comic. I'm sorry. I, didn't, I wasn't crazy about Nancy. So I made the same thing. It works with random images from Flickr, again, uh, because it's a great resource I can tap into. So it's an activity that you can do. It's more fun as a group to sort of practice putting together a story made of five different images that don't necessarily belong together. The best group I had do this was a group of fifth graders in Japan. Let's see you top them. And then last, which I, this is an entire presentation in itself. Um, maybe the video will work. Um, DS-106 is sort of a, it's, it's a cult. Anybody heard of it? No, you haven't. OK. Um, it's an open story in digital storytelling that a colleague 
of mine started from the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, and because there was a lot of work done about digital storytelling, there's the Center for Digital Storytelling that sort of um, helps people learn how to put together a personal narrative in uh, digital video format. It's fantastic. I highly recommend it. In fact, uh, Daniel Weintraub, who works for them, lives in Denver. Um, it's a great program. But it's sort of this idea about um, what happens, you know, when you tell the story of your dog that ran away when you were five. And it's a good exercise. Um, my colleague was very interested uh, in the idea about what happens when stories happen on the web. Like, we use the web as a medium um, for not only publishing the stories, but writing our work. And so the first year he taught it in 2010, the premise was, and this is another part, is that getting students, and these are, this is a freshman elective um, at, in a liberal arts college, um, to them to understand that the web is not just a place where you download stuff or you, you go on to other people's houses. It's where you can create a space of it. So the idea is that all the participants, they don't do their work in a central system. They do their work in an individual blog that they set up and they own, and they decide whether they want to keep it or not. But they do all the work in their own site, we aggregate it together. Um, in 2011, uh, he was doing a talk on this, and a colleague of mine who was there said, why don't you run this as an open course? There's these MOOC things going on, and they're terrible. And so in 2011, Jim ran this as an open course. And I was one of the people who kind of, because I'm a colleague, um, tapped into this, and I have an interest in storytelling. And it, it's a little bit kumbaya about what happened. But it went a little crazy. And um, it was right before animated GIFs got really popular and weren't just the stupid little mailbox icons from the 90s. Um, and a whole bunch of other things happened. Video was really just, well, it was taking off for a while. And so what happens is there's, it's a class that students pay for at his college, but other people on the internet just do it on their own interest. And then we built the site in a way that other classes who want to do something similar can add their students' blog to it. So it's almost like a giant community. There's a pirate internet radio station that just kind of came out of the blue. That's another story. Um, and one of the most interesting things that happened when um, Jim was planning this, we were on a, a Skype talk try, trying to give him some advice. Um, and I will wrap up soon because it is break time and I know once your selfie sticks. Um, this, this idea that he came up with, uh, his colleague, a good friend of mine named Tom Woodward, who's at um, Virginia Commonwealth right now, said, you know, Jim had done this class for a year. It was open on the internet, but it wasn't open for other people. Uh, to participate in. He said, you know, Jim, you have your 10 assignments, but they're not really that great. He's kind of sarcastic. And he said, what if there was this thing um, where um, there'd be like a bank of assignments um, that people could sort of uh, contribute new ones and they could actually go to it um, and pick the assignments that they want to do. And so uh, his colleague, and later I worked on this thing called the DS-106 Assignment Bank. So when I teach the class, my students actually um, have to go in, if we're doing uh, design, um, which is a component, there, there may be two things I want everybody to do. That'll be part of the work. But each one of these um, has a rating. It's kind of crowdsourced. And so I can just click at any time. Actually, I'm changing the ratings. And they get stars for difficulty. So I, we tell them, you have to do 20 stars worth of design assignments. They pick which ones they want to do. If they say they all suck and there's a hundred of them, make your own. So the idea is sort of like this open environment for creating um, work for other people to do. It's a really interesting model. And um, when I teach the class, I'm not really grading my students on the artistic merit of what they do. Um, they have to write up their work. So it's really important that they write, not only produce media for this course, but they have to be able to communicate where the ideas come from. Did you cite your media sources? Did you relate it to anything else? Did you describe how the heck you made the thing? So the real work in their class is writing up um, their activities on their blog. And then the last thing, and all this stuff was kind of invented in the moment as we were thinking of it. Um, is to have a place where people, uh, some of us have this idea about, it's really good um, to have a regular practice of doing something creative. And so we create this thing called the Daily Create. And so it's published every day. And it's either something, this is a writing one, um, something about the year in 2050. Some of them are uh, photography, um, something about seeing through buildings. And the whole premise is something you can probably do in 10 or 15 minutes. 
uh, share it, and then it goes on the site. This is a wide open site. It's been going on for three years. Um, so you can get ideas from it, um, or you can just do it on your own. And the idea, just like exercising and brushing your teeth, it's just worth doing something uh, creative every day. So I pretty much would love to talk for another couple hours about DS106, but um, you can catch me later. Uh, the URL at the bottom has all the uh, videos that worked and didn't work, um, as well as some extra resources that didn't uh, fit into this. Uh, I, I just love this stuff. I can't believe I get to do it on, on a regular basis. Um, if you want to talk about it, if you want to come up and tell me a story about what's on your keychain, <laughs> I'd be glad to hear it. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting people. I'm going to be here um, till Saturday because um, when I go to a conference, I just don't like to fly in and fly out. And um, I'm, I'm in Colorado for a whole week. So thank you, John, for inviting me. And thank you for bearing with the technical difficulties. Thank you. Thank you. Stay, 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 stay. We got time for a few questions <laughs> or a few stories. No, no. Any questions? It always takes a moment when you ask that. You have I to know. pause to let you. Have, you have to see the audience. Yeah. yeah. You have to find a plan. Right. Oh, there you go. Good question. Um, well, I mean, for everything, there's a history behind this stuff. So, you know, history is all biography, and so there's a lot of things you know to where these things come from. Uh, there's things you do with, like, um, what if we lived in an alternate place where the laws weren't like this? Um, invent your own laws. Um, there are simple things you can do. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people experiment with the idea of doing um, course trailers, like something like those commercials, to sort of seed people's interest. Uh, the other thing is have your stu like don't think you have to make up the stuff. Um, so there, there is um, the news is full of stories about the law. Um, well, one of the creative tools that we call it's uh, by Mozilla. It's this thing called X-ray goggles. It, it's meant to sort of teach people uh, to help them understand how web pages are put together. But you can go to any website and you click this little bookmark on your browser, and you can edit the content of anything on that page. So you can change the headlines of the New York Times to be your own story. You can go to a contract law site and sort of reinvent it um, in an imaginative way. And you can think of the goofy fun things you can do, um, but sort of talk about um, what if there's a different perspective on this. So um, I think a lot of times um, just the fact that there's not really always um, uniform answers in, in tax law. I don't really have the greatest examples to, to sort of spat off at you. Um, but I, I've not come across a subject. You know, I, I've worked with philosophy teachers. I work with math teachers. Um, th there's always something. And so creative is maybe the, the bust word there about you feel like I've got to have this big production or it's got to be flashy and showing. Um, I mean, get creative with your writing, first of all. Uh, and you know, think about the ideas about hooking interest um, and figuring out um, you can't figure out what's going to motivate everybody, um, but, but try some change-ups. I don't know. Talk to me later. I'll come up with an idea after I get more coffee. Was there an arm up? Or? I was going to comment that I think the law is, is very creative when you're teaching law. Because you're constantly coming up with hypotheticals. You're constantly trying to come up with stories that don't match the case. And so really a good law professor is doing that in every single class, every single day. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what I know about law is from watching TV in the 70s. But um, you know, I know that there's, 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 there's. I mean, it's all built on case examples and precedent. And precedent is story. Precedent are things that happen to people, often <laughs> unfortunate things. And so, you know, you might want to think about what are the shapes of your your law stories and your your case histories. When I do that Kurt Vonnegut thing, I mean, one of it is just to sort of introduce this idea. But the first assignment is to take a story. Um, or it could be a book or a movie or a TV show and actually draw a curve and annotate it. So, you know, you could do the same thing um, with a, a case study, probably. And it's time to, yeah, question. One last. <laughs> I'm wondering if it goes to, I guess, the um, question of creativity in law. If you're a judge, law sorting judge, you have a little more leeway in the way you can write what you write. If you're a new, uh, new lawyer um, and 
build lower on the code pool, your ability to be creative is, uh, is, is lesser. I'm wondering what sort of strategy when you have that sort of dynamic where you're the, you're the new person, you don't have as much power in terms of story now. Uh, the, the question's about what happens because there's kind of a hierarchy of, of it is a power structure um, from beginning lawyers to, um, you know, to the judge. First of all, I mean, it's not just in the, you know, in the courtroom where this stuff happens. So, um, you know, some of it is just this idea. I mean, I'm really big on people, like, um, being able to, you know, reflect on the work that they do because, um, like, five years, you know, past that, that point or ten years, you're sort of out of that mindset of what happened when you were first you know, starting, and you forget about some of the mistakes you made, or maybe you remember them too well. Um, so this idea, um, it's something that a colleague of mine has about the importance of narrating the work that we do. Um, for ourselves is one thing. For, for me, it's blogging and, and photos. But I can tell you what I was thinking about or doing going all the way back to 2003, because I'd sort of been doing this personal narrative. That, that's, that's sort of like an information piece, but also, it does help you give a sense uh, of your growth because when you're in the middle of a project, everything is at the forefront of your head. You know, you know, I'm working on some things right now, and it's all I can think about. Six months from now, the details get kind of uh, fuzzy. Um, but more than that, by doing it publicly, and this is what my colleague really focuses on, is it's really interesting to to see how people solve problems. And so, you know, for people in law, you know, there's law problems, but like. I have no idea what plumbers think about. I mean, the guy comes to my house and he fixes things, but how do plumbers go about solving problems? I mean, there is an interesting process, and we don't sort of share the process of what we do. It's more, we share mostly the final product. And so, um, in education a lot, we throw out everything that goes into producing the thesis or the final presentation. And there's a lot of rich detail in there that other people can learn from. Didn't really answer the full question. Good, thank you very much. Let's go. go Let's conference. conference. Go conference. <laughs> go confer.